Hi, everybody. I'm Monica Rogatti. I'm a data scientist at LinkedIn. And um, I wanted to share a quick fact with you. Um, did you know that may you live in interesting times is not a Chinese curse? It's really not. I looked it up in Snopes, so it must be true. Um, but the reason I looked that up was because I was getting kind of tired of people using what was supposedly ancient proverbs, ancient wisdom, to support whatever the point, whatever point they're trying to make. So imagine my horror when I realized that I wanted to do that exact same thing. I just couldn't resist. So I have to share this proverb with you because it fits our situation so well and the topic today. So the proverb, it's an ancient Romanian proverb, um, and it goes like this. Small kids, small problems. Big kids, big problems. To phrase it in a way that's more relevant to this audience, uh, small data, small problems. Big data, big problems, huge impact. Right. So what I'm going to be talking about today is how the data changes when your user base grows by orders of magnitude. How does the data infrastructure changes? How do the products change? How do the insights that you can get change when you have this massive growth from 1 million to 10 million to 100 million people? And the example that I'm going to use is LinkedIn, um, but I encourage you to think about your company and where you are on that curve and how things, where things are and how you're going to handle the growth. So to give you an idea of the timeline I'm talking about, because it does matter, um, I am talking about December 2004 for 1 million, and then growing to 10 million in around 2007, and then all the way up to 100 million more recently. And the key message here is that scale changes what's possible. I'm going to go through all of these stages and show you how what's possible has changed at each stage. So let's start back in 2004 and to 2006. One million people, one million users. How does the data infrastructure look back then? Well, it was very simple. There was this Oracle database in production, and there was a copy of it, a mirror of it, that we were running analytics off of. So we were doing reporting, uh, and the reporting was very inward looking. It was about the early adopters. It was about how the site behaves, uh, you know, the metrics that you usually keep track of at a startup, how the products are doing. And all of this reporting was running on one desktop. So one day, you know, our sales guy needed an Ethernet port. So <laughs> So he came and he saw an Ethernet cord going from one desktop to some router and he took it. So needless to say, yes, that's exactly what happens. That was, that was the reporting desktop and sound there somebody's desk. And so nobody got any reports. We didn't know how the site was doing until we figured out that we need a new Ethernet cord. So things were, you know, pretty small, pretty, you know, startup-y. The reporting itself was a bunch of Perl and shell scripts. Nothing wrong with that. It worked. The data products were just in their infancy. The data, data products at that time were mostly about predictive modeling. Is a user going to subscribe? Uh, sh what kind of uh, type of subscription should we show to this user? What about this other user? So it was mostly about predictive modeling. And that's when this mechanism of serving prototype data to a user was born. It was called APE, Analytics Pro Prototype Engine, right? So the idea was that you can throw some data in front of the user or some interesting recommendations or whatever your, your model was saying that you should throw in front of the user and see, see what happens. High risk, but high iteration too. And another anecdote that kind of reflects this mentality of, of you know, staying small and taking high risk was that we wanted to 
have this data product that matched people to jobs. So maybe you've gotten these emails from LinkedIn today saying, oh, you know, check out these jobs. Um, this, this might be a job that you're interested in. What about this, right? Well, so we wanted to do that all the way back in 2004. Um, so there were a lot fewer jobs, a lot fewer inventories. The inventory was a lot smaller. So what we did was, um, all, or what the guy did, uh, was putting this, um, this script and these recommendations into uh, that he was running off of Oracle into a CSV, and that went into an Excel spreadsheet. And from there, manually, the emails were generated to go out to the users. Two small problems with this. One, we left the phone number in there. And then two, the rows were off by one. <laughs> so everybody got somebody else's recommendations. Kind of sad. So the phone number was, the phone was, was just ringing off the hook all day. They just stopped answering it. Um, and the execs were being called and, you know, people were offended. Why am I getting these recommendations? This is not me. You, you got it all wrong. So the lesson there though, it, is that it's, it's high risk, high iteration, and you have to assume the risk. And it happens. And a few years later, we learn how to do it right. Hopefully you didn't get somebody else's recommendations. So scale changed what was possible. So what was possible back then was that there could be one guy, his name is Mike Greenfield, and he was the original LinkedIn data scientist, and he was running everything, all of these predictive models, all of this um, APE analytics prototype engine. The reporting desktop was Mike's machine. So it was it was possible to do all that leveraging one person. So what else was possible? As I mentioned, high risk, rapid innovation. And another particular thing that happened at that level is that you could chase the long tail by hand. When what I mean by that is that you could look at different examples of different users and look at that use case and think about how to account for it and think about how to adjust it. What was impossible was to make long tail recommendations. At that level, you don't have enough data in the long tail to make good recommendations. The data is sparse. You, you stick to the top of the distribution. So you can, you know, do things like, oh, most popular, most popular X, but you can't recommend something personalized to you because there's not enough data, whether you do collaborative filtering or any other type of recommendations. The network effects, the idea that you could have viral effects going out into the world and propagating, we're just getting started. So at that level, the speed of propagation is a lot slower. And the insights were inwards looking. They were about the early adopters. What are the early adopters doing? How do they look like? Who are they? It wasn't about the world at large. Fast forward to 10 million. The team has grown. It wasn't just one guy. It was six people. And at that point, it was a time of excitement and growing pains because things were scaling fast and you had to keep up with the scale. And that's when the data scientist was born at LinkedIn. April 2008, this is the LinkedIn job ad for what was going to become the data scientist. Yes, you're reading that right. It says no technical skills required. That's, that's what the job description looked like. That's what we're looking for. But if you read on towards the end, we were looking for intellectual sharpness and creativity. And that's still true to this day. If you, think, if you think about the particular tools, the ad is saying, we can help you learn SQL, Python, and R. But you can't, but what the ad is claiming that you can't teach is this intellectual creativity with data. And that's still true today. You can, you're looking for intellectual creativity with data, and that's a very important skill in a data scientist today. 
the relationship between data products and infrastructure at that point was very close. It was, they were intertwined. The, the products themselves drew and drove the infrastructure. So let me give you an example. People you may know, you've probably seen this pro data product, a recommendation product. It's up there in, in, on your LinkedIn page. And connecting people to each other is crucial to LinkedIn's mission. So as you can imagine, this product is a well-oiled machine. But it wasn't always like that, right? Um, when I inherited this from its inventor, Jonathan Goldman, what it was, it was a series of scripts that were run manually. There were SQL scripts, they were run manually. Um, and so to disentangle all of that and look at what dependencies, what tables were creating, being created where, what, what script generated what, and how to try to automate this, I created a diagram of the processes. And this is just a tiny portion of it. This was a very complex product. So I'm just giving you a, a quick glimpse into it, but around creating table number 10, and let's not get into naming variables like that. That's a discussion for a whole different day. Um, so after creating table number 10 in the database, we would manually take that table out and move it to Mike's machine, different Mike. That's when, that's where the graph mining algorithm was running. So the graph mining algorithm was all in memory, it was loading everything up, managing the graph, and producing some scores, some recommendations. And then we would manually copy all of that back to the database. And at that point, we would move on by hand to table number 20. Not a well-oiled machine, but things change. Scale changes things. So staying with the same idea of data products and data infrastructure, what I'm trying to communicate here is that the data product drove the infrastructure change. We first had people you may know on Oracle in the setup I mentioned before. Then we moved it to Greenpalm, distributed database. Then we moved it to Aster Data, and that's when I made that diagram. And then we moved it to Hadoop, where it currently lives. And people you may know is the product that drove adoption of Hadoop throughout the organization. It's the product, it was the use case that drove technology forward. So you could argue, or you could say that people you may know was for, was to LinkedIn data infrastructure was por what porn was to the internet. Because, because it's this use case that's very data intensive and that drives infrastructure innovation. People you may know. Other data infrastructure innovation is, again, credit to people you may know. Voldemort, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but the idea was that we had, after we created, we ran all of those manual scripts, we had this huge table of one billion rows that you have to move to production into an Oracle database. And you didn't need a database. You didn't need to do any complex processing there. All you needed was to look things up. For this guy who comes into the LinkedIn website, what are there people you may know? Just look it up, Just that's it. No database, none of those guarantees, none of that complexity. And it needed to be distributed because going beyond one billion rows was a little tougher in production and keeping the, the homepage at the SLAs where it's supposed to be. So that's how Voldemort was born. So Voldemort is a distributed key value store where you could just plug in your table of data and then you have a key, which in this case was the member, uh, member's ID, and then you have some data in which case the other people that this person should connect to. Azkaban, another open source, Voldemort is open source too, another open source project that was born out of the need created by people you may know. We had this very complex flow and dependencies and we wanted to automate it. So make wasn't cutting it. So we wanted to have this more sophisticated scheduling mechanism that was running Hadoop jobs, that was, that was able to kind of have things run smoothly and not restart all the way from the beginning if you already got to some, some stable point. 
So that's how Azkaban was born. Let's go to another product because this is the one that I built on my laptop in Python. It was called Talent Match. And the idea there is that somebody posts a job on LinkedIn and we automatically suggest candidates that might match that job. Running on my laptop in Python, connecting to the database, and I kept saying, hey, you know, this is an alpha prototype. We're just, you know, looking to see whether this product is gonna get adoption or, or whether it's some, this is interesting or if, th if this is even working, we wanna kind of show it to clients. Well, somehow I got, I was convinced to put it out there in front of, in front of users. So that was kind of a problem because one Sunday, um, I slept in, I didn't wake up at nine, so I didn't open my laptop, so the cron job didn't run. <laughs> so on Monday, there were no results for people, and that's when the phone started ringing off the hook again, um, because the sales guys were saying, talent match is down, talent match is down. And I was saying, but, but no, it's an alpha, it's a prototype, we weren't even gonna put it up there. It didn't matter. It was successful. You have to move it off the laptop, right? It sounds obvious now, but it wasn't back then, right? So we moved it to a server. <laughs> um, but since then, we created this infrastructure, this recommendation engine infrastructure that is a more general Lucene-based technology that can handle entity-to-entity -entity recommendations. It's a more general way of doing recommendations. Again, a product that was successful drove infrastructure innovation. Insights, let's move on to insights. There's something very interesting, a shift, a very interesting shift that happened there. When you moved from having your early adopters and talking about them to starting to get insights into the wider world. So what do I mean by that? You could look at people's LinkedIn profiles and look at when they started a job and in what industry and draw conclusion, normalize things properly and draw conclusions about the world around you and about the timing of things and how industries were eb ebbing and, and, and uh, how they were growing and how they, they were declining. So in this graph, um, I think there was an XKCD cartoon about not lab labeling my axes, that's me. Uh, but the axis there, the reason is that this is a normalized percentage of people who started the job that year. This is all normalized. So this is just to enable you to see the effects of an industry. So if an industry is above uh, the axis, above zero, it's growing. If it's below, it's declining. So what you can see there is the internet going up in 94 and then having another huge bubble in 1999 and then a bubble busting in 2001. This is amazing to me because you could see that um, in the LinkedIn data, aggregating the LinkedIn profiles. So you started to get insights into the world around you, not, a, not just about the early adopters. Real estate, growing nicely and then all of a sudden going up and then tanking. Same thing happening to financial services. It's amazing. This was all in the data and from the public profile of people contributing uh, to their profiles, right? So if you look at when they started their job, this is what the data tells you. Using the same methodology, you can look at what are the fastest growing title in a given year. 1999, software engineer, web developer. Sounds familiar? 2001, <laughs> everybody went back to grad school. 2008, gaming art, of all things, gaming art was the fastest growing title. That was fascinating because there are things like digital compositor, environmental artist. I saw that and I was thinking, what's an environmental artist? Is that like environment? Is it taking care of, I, I didn't know what it was, but it was, it's people in computer games, of building all that rich environment for you to, to play in. 
still change what was possible. You could have insights about the world, the world around you. So insights into the world were possible there then, at that point. So what else was possible? Well, the network effects were much, much stronger. It was much, it was much easier to spread information. And then infrastructure innovation was driven by all of these use cases. Growing pains led to infrastructure innovation. What was impossible still was the long tail recommendation. The data was still too sparse. And these insights that I mentioned were not industry specific or were not segmented to, to uh, groups of individuals. They were just about the world at large. But they were still very interesting, just not segmented because there wasn't enough data. And what was even more interesting was that we had very little resources, but so many ideas of what to build next and what to do with the data and what we could explore with the data and what products were possible with the data and how we could change the world with that data. But we had to prioritize them very carefully. Let's fast forward to 100 million. This was in 2011. The team has grown a lot. Let's see what was possible then. The infrastructure has evolved. And that's putting it mildly. Hadoop cluster is going to be 1,900 machines by the end of the year. Much, much bigger than my laptop. We have a data infrastructure team. A data infrastructure team. Not just at some, a desktop under somebody's desk with an Ethernet cord that somebody can steal. We are building more and more technology that we're open sourcing and contributed to the greater community to deal not only with large data and distributed data, but to re with real-time data stream. Kafka is an example of that. Espresso is another example. And reporting is widespread and very well instrumented. We have a mobile app for reporting, right? They're servers, they're dedicated teams. Again, it, it came a long way because we invested in it, and it came a long way from that desktop under somebody's desk. The insights. The insights are even more interesting now because you, you can get insights not only into the world at large, but you can segment and slice and dice by whatever you want. So let, let me give you an example. Let's look at when is the best time of the year to get a promotion. Um, well, it's January, but the point is that you can slice and dice that data by, for example, date of birth. And you can see how the millennials are being promoted increasingly throughout the year, as opposed to in January, like their older counterparts. So what's going on there? Interesting question. You can slice and dice the same data by industry, so you can notice patterns into how people are getting promoted in different industries. You can notice that some industries have a quarterly pattern of promotions. Some industries have this summer spike. Um, and, and then in, in some others, it's just almost uniform throughout the year. But the key there is that you can slice and dice the data. There's a lot more cuts than that that I haven't shown here. Um, among them is the fact that if you slice by country, you can rediscover that India's fiscal year is in April. Another example, you can look at things like overrepresented CEO names and the distribution of the length of a name for a given profession, right? So let's look at that. Sales, top overrepresented names are Chip, Todd, and Trey. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and look at that spike. Look at that distribution. It's, it's so skewed. Look at that. Four, basically you almost have to have a four-letter four four name to be a sales guy. <laughs> CEOs, it's similar. It's still centered at four. They want to be friendly. They, wanna, they want you to call them by their nickname. And um, you, they, you know, they shorten their name if they don't have a short one, right? Engineering, not so much. Andrew stays Andrew. It's not Andy. Restaurant. Very interesting. 
it's even longer and longer names. But the point here is that you can look at this and, and slice and dice this and get this information because the data richness and the long tail is there. And you can take a group of people and compare them to the rest of the LinkedIn population. For example, you can take a look at entrepreneurs and see what makes them different from the rest of the world. You can see what schools they went to in this, disproportionately. What companies did they come from? Where, you know, how long did they stay at their job? What did they major in college? You, you can look at all kinds of interesting cuts for a certain group of people, which was impossible before with, with much less data. So at that point, you can come up with, for example, a recipe with, for how to, what, what the typical entrepreneur looks like, right? And, and it goes like this. Um, you have to drop out of banking, you have to go st get an MBA. <laughs> any, any banking dropout here? Um, so you have to go to Stanford and do an MBA. And then you have to convince your IIT graduate co-founder to leave Yahoo and then, <laughs> and then join LinkedIn and connect to VCs and bloggers. That's what the data was telling us. So you can chase the long tail, again. You can build products that are recommended to each individual that are specialized to them. You can recommend jobs. You can recommend companies that they might want to follow. You can, recommend, you can recommend jobs for their friends and get them to join your company. You can chase the long tail, make long tail recommendations. And even, even more, useful is that you can give people personalized insights. It's not just me sitting behind that computer and finding insights into the world. It's you finding insights about you. Things like who viewed your profile and how do you slice and dice that? And how does your professional network look like visualized? If you haven't seen this, I encourage you to check it out at inmaps.linkedinlabs.com. It's a visualization of your professional network. And you can see how people cluster in unexpected ways, or maybe in expected ways, but it's beautiful and it's very informative and it tells you a lot about how your professional network looks like. It's personalized insights. And you can crowdsource insights. Everybody's data together is more valuable, is exponentially more valuable. This is the, our skills pages, our skills product where you take skills that people put in their profile and you can look at trends. You can look at jobs that are demanding that skill. You can look at what the top people are. It's crowdsourced insights in addition to personalized insights. Scale changed what was possible. Ch scale changed what's possible. So what's possible at 100 million? Slice and diced insights, very valuable. Network effects are just huge at that point and you hit much better economies of scale. You can run fast A-B tests because the data, as in, you saw in the previous talk, the data is there to make a decision immediately. Yes, I have enough statistical significance there with this many people. What's not possible are casual hour-long outages. It's not possible to have that APE analytics prototype engine um, you know, thrown on the site and then have a bug where it's an iframe that's within an iframe and it basically loads the entire site into a little iframe and then it recursively goes all the way until the entire site crashes. True story. <laughs> you can't have that anymore when you have 100 million depending on you with their professional network. And you can't test in production on 100% of the users. So I think, the, I think that the LinkedIn user kind of appreciates appreciate those two things, so I'm not too sad about losing them. But what's more encouraging to me is the fact that we still have a lot more ideas than we can implement and we have to prioritize, but we have the resources to make things happen. We have the resources to put all of those products together and put all of those data insights together. So let's revisit this. 
Let's take a look at, if you remember this, this was the data scientist ad from back when it was born in 2008 and how we were saying that no specific technical skills are required. Well, so things have changed a little bit. The data scientist is in its teenage years. Look at that growth. So I have that chart of how the data scientist and analytics jobs have grown over the past few years. But what's more impressive about that chart is that it's normalized data. It's as a percentage of all the job starters that year. So not only is it growing like that, but it's actually growing and stealing market share from other professions. Impressive growth, teenage years. Job description. Do you know enough about information retrieval, machine learning, and statistics? We are asking for experience, deep knowledge, data mining, technical skills. So that the job requirements have matured a little bit too. But what hasn't changed was the fact that we're still looking for that kind of sharpness and intellectual creativity with data. Scale changed what was possible. And that's the message that I'm going to leave you with. And I think I have uh, time for questions. Yes. Are there, uh, you know, 10x, yeah, that's an interesting one to think about. Um, I think this idea, so the, to, to repeat the question was, what was not, was not po what's not possible now that is going to be possible in 10x? Um, I think it's just going to be magn magnifying these effects of network effects, of how fast information spreads and what we can do with the data. Um, at 10X, the news can be personalized to you, to your own profile and to your own behavior because there's enough data there. The long tail recommendations can get even further into the long tail. Um, so that's, that's the general direction. But if you think about the technologies that existed back then and that don't exist back, that didn't exist back then and that exist now, we couldn't possibly imagine them. So it's, it's quite possible that in 10x, we're going to have totally different technologies that we're going to enable us to do something completely different that we can't see right now. So the, everything is open. Yes? Nothing was robust. As it was changing, <laughs> some of your graphs could be different when you were doing Oh, right. So, um, yeah, it's actually, so the question is how, how things were changing um, as, as you, yes, so there was a shift. There was a shift because um, the makeup of the members changed. So if before the early adopters were mostly in tech and finance, um, as LinkedIn was grew more popular and more accessible to everybody and all the professionals at all levels, the kind of insights that we could get changed, and yes, the type of things uh, that, that we could get from it changed and were more general and even more applicable to the world at large than in the early days. Yes. Two questions in the back. Um, lessons. Right. So this would be more applicable to companies, right, rather than industries. So the, the idea is that you know when you're in early stages, what kind of things have I learned? Um, I've learned that you have to adapt at, for each, each stage has its own challenges and you have to adapt to all of those challenges. And um, you have, yes, you have to think a step ahead and see what's, what's going to be possible at the next level and build the tools 
that enable you to be at the next level. Um, so I guess my advice would, would be to be ready for the next level. Um, there is another question. Um, yeah, so the question is more about the data scientist as a generalist versus losing that capability and becoming more and more specialized. Um, it's true that as you get more and more people, you, people tend to specialize and gravitate towards visualization versus, or, or towards statistics or, or towards, uh, you know, pig and Hadoop and more infrastructure type of, um, type of skills. Um, but I think the, the, the key there that hasn't changed was that creativity with data and data skepticism, which was also in an earlier talk today, uh, those haven't changed. So in that sense, a good generalist that has all of those can acquire the skills right away. A lot of these tools didn't exist back then. Uh, you know, only five years ago, a lot of those tools didn't exist. A lot of those technologies didn't exist. The only constant was change. So we have to be able to adapt to that and learn new, new tools uh, at each stage. So I don't think the role of the generalist is lost. I think the generalist just has to adapt at every step, which was true before. Bharat? Um, I think there's, there's a danger to uh, scaling prematurely, right? Uh, because it costs money, and if you don't have the need for it, then you're, you're, spe you, you're spending that money inefficiently, or those resources, or those people. And there's something to be said about taking the risks, those risks when, when you can. It's, there's something to be said uh, about being able to just iterate very quickly and with the risk that you're going to just bring the whole site down, and that's fine. There's, there's, there's something very special about that stage that um, I, I don't think it should be skipped. Yes? We are coming up with new solutions. Uh, so the answer is both, right? So we switch to technologies that could adapt uh, to, to, that's to the uh, next scale, to the next order of magnitude, and that's Hadoop, that's uh, Azkaban, that's Voldemort. Uh, so we switch to technologies that could adapt. But as it actually happens, you you run into new uh, problems and into new interesting challenges to overcome. So as I mentioned, you know, small data, small problems, big data, big problems, huge impact. That is still happening at every level. Yes, one more in the back. Oh yes, everybody who sees this data wants me to use it to predict the stock market. Um, I don't want to go to jail. So <laughs> um, it's an interesting one because it's a question of to what extent these, these signals can be sent in real time. Um, and I think a lot of those you, you can see in, in real time. So for example, the fastest growing, um, the fastest growing titles bit that I saw, um, I checked it about uh, a year ago it was social media, right? So uh, it's interesting because things are going at, growing at a much faster pace now, and social media uh, was ahead of that. So I'm looks like I'm out of time. So thank you, everybody.